indicates that you are ready. We are ready. Um, so, everyone welcome, ladies and gentlemen, this is the second session, second round table discussion about sharpening conflicts. Indeed, um, since we had the first one, that was April 21st, um, six weeks ago, conflicts are sharpening. Um, and uh, many of us feels like um, Alice in Wonderland, except that this, that this word is not a wonder word, it's a very chaotic and increasingly chaotic word in my understanding. Um, <clears throat> so we have again um, three distinguished and, um, uh, and three also very distinguished younger speakers, altogether six. We have um, um, the first round, which will be about one hour, and then we open the floor and we ask you to ask questions and make comments, and then we give back the word for the speakers. I'd like to ask um, again um, Dr. Buzek to start. Um, he, his reflections are on, as, in the, as it indicates in the title, Europe and Central Europe. Um, and and um, then um, the, uh, Professor Evin is is going to come, um, concentrating on on the Western European changes and scenarios combined with the changing Balkan scenario in the shade of of Turkey, Russia, and and the Trump land. Um, and then I'll ask Ivan to come up with more um, Eastern Central European. Um, scenarios or possible um, future explanations. So, Dr. Buzek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Many thanks for the invitation and for the possibility, because indeed I think uh, the time in which we are living uh, is described by sharpening conflicts after, in this part of Europe where I grew up, after the Second World War, we had comparatively a very stable situation. I think uh, the expectation of my generation was, uh, it was a little bit different in Hungary, it has to be said, in other uh, countries, but I think after 1945, each year it was going up a little bit, going up a little bit, going up a little bit. Uh, the perspectives uh, were growing uh, by the way to European integration, coming closer by the neighbours and so on and so on. And may I say, and looking here to Central European scenarios, uh, with my friend Ambassador Briggs, uh, we wrote a book uh, about uh, Central Europe and there was a certain time of a revival uh, of discussions about uh, Central Europe, Casa de Europa uh, and so on and so on. It was a, a real discussion. Maybe it was very much influenced by European integration, but uh, I think the background uh, was also uh, neighborhood. Uh, thank you. Uh, neighborhood and, and coming uh, closer together. Uh, may, I say, may I say first part, uh, one uh, idea, uh, one view has to be said, I think uh, to establish uh, permanent peace was one of the main aims uh, of this time. Uh, I was uh, campaigning uh, not only in Austria but also in other parts concerning the European Union. It is a peace project. I think this ended uh, maybe for some years ago. It was really strange, a younger generation being present in discussion said to me, ah, stop always to talk about the peace project in the European Union, we have peace. If I'm speaking now about peace, nobody is standing up and saying we have peace. Uh, I think on the contrary, we have expectations uh, about difficulties uh, and conflicts. One line. The second line which we have to introduce, and it's not in the title, is uh, the global changes. I think we are very much influenced by this, not only by Donald Trump, because you have always now to mention Donald Trump, uh, it's a little bit over-exaggerating because there are also some other Americans existing. Uh, just, uh, I think, to, to, to make a part, I was last week at a meeting about uh, United States of America and Europe with a strong American uh, presence. It was in the days uh, where Donald Trump uh, declared that he is going out of the uh, Paris uh, Agreement. We had uh, 
two senators and uh, some of uh, American universities, and they were really angry as we were speaking. Oh, now America is leaving this uh, important agreement uh, on ecology and so on and so on because they said 37 states of the United States will follow this line still. I think, why are you always listening only to Donald Trump and you are not looking to the federalism uh, uh, in the United States? And we say day after, I switched on the TV, and uh, my dear fellow citizen, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, appeared and said the same, quite straight and outspoken uh, in a certain yeah. powerful way <laughs> he's doing. I think this we have to consider, that's the reason why mentioning Donald Trump, I'm adding this, but it's not a real theme. The real theme is that uh, we have uh, tremendous global changes. We left for, since a long time uh, the system of dual powers, uh, East-West conflict and so on and so on. Uh, nowadays we are spe speaking about multipolarity, uh, what it really is, uh, is not exactly, but that might be an interesting subject of our discussions. But looking to the map, we can see uh, different uh, uh, powers within multipolarity uh, playing here for sure a role. It's necessary to mention because we have tremendous changes in technology, uh, by research, uh, by media, by technology, uh, by uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, uh, and so on and so on. I think uh, this is uh, changing in the reality and we have not yet the capacity to handle it. I'm sometimes a little bit extreme. I'm here just to mention it. Personally, I'm convinced we are in the beginning of the Third World War. Uh, I think it might be the right year. Uh, the First World War was declared by our beloved Emperor Franz Josef, uh, making a declaration. Uh, which for, was formulated by a poet. Uh, I think uh, if you imagine today that the war declaration <laughs> is written by a poet, it's really strange, but very impressive. Uh, the Second World War was declared not by a poet, but by Adolf Hitler. Uh, since 545, uh, uh, we are shooting back concerning uh, Nazi Germany and Poland. Uh, and now I think a kind of warfare is creeping in in our societies, uh, appearing on different places, uh, in the moment very often in the United Kingdom, but also at a uh, railway station of Atoha, at subways, uh, at uh, Christmas markets, and so on and so on. I think you can have it endless. And I think it is a challenge uh, for our uh, form of living together, it's endangering and it is creating a lot of fear. I think what we have to consider in this on sharpening conflicts is the technique now for the moment by several powers to create more fear. Yes. I think fear is a very strange factor and it has an impact on politics. And to be quite straight, uh, for sure, I'm a democratic politician for a long time, uh, but obviously I think uh, our democratic systems uh, are not really able to took off the fear. I think it is still existing. On the other side, it is even concerning democracy used to get votes. Uh, if you are looking to the campaigning uh, the last days in the United Kingdom, I think the question of fear and how to handle all this is one of the main subjects. <coughs> Not in a positive way, how can we hinder it? Uh, I think Mrs. May has reduced the police, uh, is one argument, and so on and so on. I think things are coming up uh, in our peaceful parts in Europe which we are not a subject. May I say it for Austria? I will not be concentrated on my country, but I think we, after a time where we had nearly no army, uh, it's ridiculous uh, what we have. Uh, it was always said the fire brigade of Passau at the Austrian border is stronger than the Austrian army. Uh, nowadays, I think it was decided we are getting tanks uh, and uh, helicopters and so on and so on. We have my doubts that we are able to fight with helicopters and tanks such terrorists uh, with a belt blowing up uh, things. 
what I'm here criticizing or mentioning is we have not yet found uh, the real reaction, the real technique, and so on and so on. Even our information systems are not working. Uh, after such events, uh, like recently Manchester, London is already coming up, and information was existing in part one, but this was not given to others uh, who should handle it. Uh, I think here we are living in the information society, which, which is in some parts not really working. Uh, and I think that's also a problem because the trust in institutions, in state institutions, the trust in democratic institutions, and the trust in the capacity to solve the problems is shrinking. Is shrinking, and that's for sure true also on the international level, because all the conflicts, look to Ukraine, uh, Crimea, and so on and so on, has happened. Uh, Security Council of the United Nations uh, uh, needed weeks uh, to, to discuss it, uh, having no consequences, uh, and so on and so on. So far, I think one of the things which we should discuss what are uh, the techniques, what is the way to, uh, to deal uh, with this, uh, this situation. Because it has an impact on democracy, here is a second title, Decaying Democracy is, which is a pity, right. There are some answers, I think, uh, looking for strong men. There is a certain desire of strong men, they are admired uh, in this, uh, it's not necessary to mention names, uh, they are all pretty well known. Uh, also, in the political discussion, there is a request for a more powerful action. Nobody needs exactly what it means, but it is reducing all kinds of freedom and so on and so on. Uh, I think uh, there is a need, obviously, I think, to regulate more, uh, which I think is for sure also a problem. Uh, concerning Europe, this I want to mention after a short view to global affairs. We have to look to the fact that we Europeans are 7% of the global population. Now, we are still a little bit more than 20% of the economic power. Uh, I think under the next 15 years, uh, we will shrink to 4% of the global population. Uh, and the real request is, uh, for what is Europe standing? What is the contribution of Europe in this developing world? Uh, there are a lot of questions. I think I'm really fed up to switch on TV uh, because uh, always some politicians and also philosophers and uh, university professors are appearing and saying, I think we have to discuss what are the European values. Yeah? Uh, there's nearly no answer afterwards. Uh, I have the desire always to call them uh, and saying, Explain the European values. Don't uh, uh, ask the question, give some answers. Uh, that's for sure a problem. The contrast program to this is a specific political role of religion. Uh, religion is in a certain way for the Europeans reappearing. Uh, it is reduced only to looking to the Islam, which for sure is not true. It's not only the Islam having some more radical directions, I think uh, if you have the opportunity, and uh, I did it, uh, to listen to some Russian Orthodox uh, ideologists, uh, priests, and so on and so on, oh, oh, oh. it's also quite heavy in a certain direction, uh, a little bit used by Putin, I think, but sometimes uh, my beloved uh, professors of the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, are uh, more radical than Putin. Uh, also, don't underestimate it. Uh, on the other side, it's giving security. Ah, he has a strong power, he has a strong ideology, uh, which for sure uh, is uh, going <coughs> forward. I think here we are lacking orientation because uh, all uh, the instruments which we had, Völkerbund, it was after the First World War, uh, the United Nations after the Second World War, are not really able to hinder things. Uh, if you look to the fact that North Korea uh, and the beloved dictator is doing there is really crazy. Uh, it's far off from here from Europe, not a danger, uh, but maybe it has an impact on Japan uh, and how our reactions are, and so on and so on. I think for a longer time it was quite usual uh, to have a lot of fear concerning the Chinese. 
I think there are 2.3 uh, billion people, they will all come. I remember the main fear of uh, my father-in-law was the Chinese will come. Huh? He has a small house in Lower Austria was saying, but he is sure here the Chinese will sit in this house and so on and so on. Uh, it's uh, one of these exodus, one of these fears, basic fears for sure existing. Maybe it's turning around, the, the rockets of the North Koreans might come or, or whatever. Uh, I think we tried to develop for a longer time really a peace system and for the moment it's breaking into pieces. It, some parts are still existing, some parts are not really working. My last points, uh, between powerful neighbors. I think the question of a real neighborhood policy in Europe was never really solved. Uh, I think uh, an Austrian lady was in charge uh, of this question, uh, proposing a neighborhood policy, uh, but uh, it appeared never in the European Union. I think, in reality, I think the difficulties with the neighbors are increasing. Uh, beg your pardon for, all, for again mentioning Austria, but what the Austrian government uh, did was to create more problems with all the neighbors we have. I think uh, the real desire, the real need is, I think, to create a closer cooperation uh, concerning of neighborhood. I think uh, we should have common activities of Central Europe. We should have common activities of Europe, uh, which for sure is not really existing. And the discussion is going in the wrong direction. We are all discussing that Mr. Trump said 2% of the GDP had to put in uh, in uh, military issues and so on and so on, obviously, because he wants to sell weapons, which he did successful in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think uh, that's not a real question. The real question is how can we create a system uh, uh, creating more peace, more possibilities, more dialogue, more connections, and so on and so on. It's not a question of the weapons. Weapons are necessary. I am not living in illusions. Uh, and so on and so on, but I think the strategy here, how we can we move together uh, better by keeping uh, the view on different uh, problems, keeping the view that conflicts are also existing, it is necessary, I think, to have more instruments going in this direction. Maybe if politics are not doing it so far, here, this institute in Kazek has to do it. Yes, so far, I think yeah, so. Finish. Excel excellent introduction. Thank you, excellent keynote talk. Now, Ahmed, it's your turn. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, and um, it is um, uh, difficult, of course, to uh, follow uh, uh, Dr. Busek's uh, introductory remarks uh, that uh, cover so uh, captivatingly and uh, so thoughtfully a range of issues. Um, I will therefore be more prosaic and um, uh, focus on three aspects, uh, touching uh, uh, certain aspects of uh, what Dr. Busek said. But uh, as we were talking earlier, um, there is a a key fear that we had about the European Union, uh, European Union falling apart and, and uh, European Union, uh, which is true, of course, its uh, share in world population, more importantly in uh, world GDP, is declining because uh, others are uh, getting more populous and, and richer and so on and so forth. Uh, to add to it, there were, since the uh, global uh, economic crisis, the subprime crisis followed by uh, Euro crisis, um, uh, the, the, there was a cause for pessimism, um, the situation with Greece, and uh, nobody wants to really mention Italy, uh, which is too big to fail. Nevertheless, the uh, uh, Italian uh, economy is uh, really resting more on expenditure than uh, savings and, and production and still continuing that way. But there is, I think, there is a cause for optimism in the sense that what we have seen 
um, seems to be uh, we are over the lowest ebb. Uh, Brexit to the west and uh, uh, departure from the uh, what we have been used to calling European norms of uh, some Eastern European uh, countries taking adversarial attitude uh, towards uh, the uh, democratic and participatory uh, priorities of the European Union. Uh, this seems to have been reversed. At least we're seeing that uh, the elections in France and before that, uh, the uh, elections in uh, the Netherlands showed that the core, the initial six EEC, the uh, core Europe, uh, basically was not shaken by this, but rather maybe it was shaken to come back to its senses and look at its accomplishments rather than uh, going on the way towards further uh, centrifugal um, uh, tendency. That gives me a cause for optimism in the sense that the, uh, the core, which is really Western Europe, um, the, so to speak, the, um, uh, the lands of the Holy Roman Empire plus France, um, essentially, um, through the Middle Ages that developed what we now uh, call essential European values, and a lot of us uh, are not aware of that. We all think that democracy and everything is, is uh, the result of the French Revolution, but no, it isn't. It is not so much that, but um, uh, essentially it goes back to a particularly Western notion that there is interdependence between the empire and the pope, and that none of them were in terms of tradition, in terms of uh, law, in terms of uh, custom, uh, none of them were uh, dominant over the other. Politically, of course, sometimes uh, one side weighed, sometimes the other side weighed, but this is, uh, that, uh, that uh, a antecedent in Europe's history, I think, is, is very important, and we've seen that uh, part of, of Europe to uh, turn to these and uh, to turn to these uh, values that were ultimately developed into the uh, peaceful post Second World War values of democracy, rule of law, and uh, 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 respect for minorities and human rights and so on and so forth to come back to that. So there is uh, some. A, a considerable amount of glue in that uh, for Western Europe. Now that doesn't mean that the fact that Western Europe has this glue, uh, that glue is going to hold the rest of the world. Um, there is, uh, the rest of the world um, uh, needs uh, a lot more glue than uh, one part of the world is able to give because there are other problems uh, that haunt uh, the rest of the world, and some of that rest of the world is, in fact, Eastern Europe. So, um, the, uh, the situation of the Balkans is, um, is a case in point that I want to uh, touch upon in this context. In the sense that uh, uh, what's happening in the Balkans is um, uh, not only deplorable, but I think it's also very dangerous. Uh, we'll look at the history of the Balkans. Um, it is, uh, there uh, has been a good reason in history uh, for uh, various leaders to call the Balkans uh, keg of power. Uh, Balkans tend to uh, blow up in ways that we have seen in the, in, uh, in, in the past. Uh, and certainly in the 20th century, um, that are very destructive uh, for the Balkans and for uh, the uh, broader region, including all of Europe. Um, First World War, later on, and the Bosnian War, Kosovo, and, so, and all these. Now, the, there is an added danger in the Balkans now, 
And we have to take that into consideration in the sense that after the Bosnia and Kosovo uh, war, the essentially um, modernist ethnic identities were further reinforced by religious ethnic identities, particularly uh, during and, and after the uh, Bosnian War, um, uh, by uh, Ankara, certainly, and by Saudi Arabia, and uh, other leading countries of um, the uh, so-called now the Sunni alliance. They took this as an opportunity to um, propagate uh, a, a Islamic solidarity in the Balkans, which uh, really put a wedge uh, between the uh, peoples of the Balkans, uh, a stronger cultural uh, wedge than um, the smaller ethnic groups not getting on with one another. Uh, that is one problem. The other problem is, of course, um, uh, the neighboring regional uh, powers. Um, the last time I did mention uh, Turkey, but uh, briefly I said something to the effect uh, that Ankara is preoccupied with so many other things that as far as the Balkan policy is concerned, that is not going to be a priority for a while to come. Um, I, I can repeat that more or less because priorities might be changing, but certainly the uh, Gulf region and the immediate periphery of Turkey and uh, Turkey's uh, aims and objectives in Syria are uh, overriding priorities now that reaching out to the Balkans will necessarily uh, be in the second or third place. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, as I also mentioned the last time, that existing um, existing networks, uh, not necessarily government to government, uh, existing networks of uh, Muslim communities um, will, uh, will not be playing a role. I think they will be playing a role in uh, terms of uh, this religious identity and religious solidarity in the Balkans. So that is a second point uh, that um, I think one needs to um, take into consideration. Uh, one is also worried about uh, Mr. Putin's uh, involvement. Um, in this regard, uh, there is, I believe, a similarity between uh, three leaders, um, Putin uh, and um, uh, Erdogan and Mr. Trump. And that similarity is that all three are unpredictable. So um, the, it isn't that there will be a priority, uh, particularly of, uh, in, in, in their minds with regard to um, uh, the Balkans. I really do not know whether Mr. Trump knows uh, on the map where the Balkans are. Nevertheless, uh, the unpredictability is a menace in itself. Uh, in today's news or yesterday's news, the fact that uh, Mr. Trump was gloating over um, the isolation of Qatar uh, in his tweets, uh, at the same time uh, that the, the largest American base in the region is in Qatar, is, is completely oblivious to that, uh, to that fact, is a, is, is a problem. So, uh, ultimately, that, that kind of a, uh, a situation, that unpredictable, uh, unpredictability also in the sense that Mr. Putin, for example, takes uh, uh, any opportunity uh, to uh, drive a wedge anywhere 
Uh, and particularly, the Balkans are important because of the uh, historic connections with the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, Russian Serbian, uh, and, and so on. Um, and this is one way of uh, an opportunity to, to reassert the near abroad and extend it to the, to the Balkans. Now, um, uh, so in a way, I've come to the point that you might say, well, you started out by optimistic note about uh, the European Union and you're saying all these things about the uh, Balkans, everything falling apart and, and uh, um, transatlantic plus uh, Middle Eastern and uh, uh, Eastern and Russian uh, leaders there um, uh, may have the potential to make matters worse. Um, well, there is a problem and one, one has to start thinking about the possibilities of what Europe can do because uh, the, the, the Balkans are, um, stability of the Balkans uh, is essential uh, to make European Union a credible uh, actor that can bring peace. And uh, European Union's ability to bring peace to the continent has been questioned only with regard to, and particularly with regard to, um, the development in the, in the Balkans over the last three decades. Um, and we also have to take into consideration that uh, the uh, EU leverage is low. EU leverage is low not only because EU doesn't have the power, but the, the point is that the volition, uh, the objective to become a part of the European Union is not so strong on the part of uh, the, these fragmented Balkans either. Because the point is that the, uh, it is almost impossible uh, and and uh, these countries and these populations realize that it's almost impossible for the, uh, the current state of politics and society in the Balkans to really come as full members of the European Union. So what can Europe do? Um, there is, I mean, any, um, any soft power appeal will have a hollow ring to it. That is not a realistic option. But I think Europe has also realized, the core Europe, and particularly Chancellor Merkel, has realized that uh, this notion of Europe as a family of uh, members of equal weight is not going to work. So I have to go back to not your other card. Uh, that the alternative to a uh, united or even a federalist Europe is not your other card, <coughs> but a well-defined uh, Europe of variable geometry. I call it variable geometry because I do not believe. I think it's misnomer to call it multi-speed Europe. Multi-speed, the very word, just uh, uh, brings to mind a uh, car uh, race course with uh, some cars going faster, the other ones will never be able to catch up with them. But a very well-defined Europe, which certain important values that have described the first pillar and the Copenhagen criteria, everyone um, uh, um, conforms to that, but then it is not possible and it is in fact damaging to force incoming people to incoming countries to, <coughs> for example, move into the Eurozone. I mean, lots of countries that have moved into the Eurozone, Greece is a perfect example, they cannot devalue and they cannot do anything about it. So, uh, that is what I mean by uh, a uh, Europe of, of uh, variable geometry, very well defined, of core, uh, and then not periphery, but countries that uh, are uh, complementing the core 
in certain <coughs> important ways. They belong uh, culturally uh, to, the, uh, to the same family as the core, but economically, uh, uh, fiscally, financially, um, uh, they will um, be given a, a freer reign. Now, the reason I said that is that that sort of an approach, uh, if it could be formulated um, in a, a reasonable amount of time, will make a membership into uh, that kind of uh, uh, Europe a credible proposition. Uh, if and therefore might reactivate a, an interest in the Balkans to uh, come, into the, come into the fold. I do not know of uh, any other quick um, way of uh, doing this, but European soft power has to, uh, come, uh, has to uh, develop into a, uh, into a position of offering credible ways rather than sort of a long-distance future. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ivan Babo, Mr. State Secretary. Well, the many, many issues have been touched upon, and I could react to some of them only because the time is limited. I would like to start with a question which was discussed so many times during the 80s in Hungary. It is the European values and the European identity. Uh, and uh, here in Central Europe, uh, with the best thinkers of these issues, like Milan Kundera or Janusz or some Polish writers, we came to the, the common platform that the pillars of the European identity are the ancient Greek culture, the Roman law, and the Christianity. These are the three pillars of the European identity. And these pillars were developed during the centuries by Reformation, Enlightenment, uh, liberalism, uh, socialism, conservatism, and so on and so on, until the up to the 20th century where these values were more or less the ruling values of the world order. The liberal view was the ruling uh, set of values of the world order and upon these values were established uh, international organizations and the whole network, huge network of international organizations. So that, that was a very nice period of this. Now the question is whether Europe is still sticking to these values. And I have the feeling that not so much. And not Eastern Europe, but core Europe is the questionable as well. Uh, uh, I would like to turn your attention just to one aspect of it, and this is not the culture and not the democracy or not the politics, but the legal problems. The European Union is based upon common values, common political efforts, but first of all, it's a set of treaties. It's called Aki Communautaire. Mm -hmm. It's a, such a volume of different agreements, and can this we, means, we, we, yes, yes, it's uh, 50,000 pages or 20,000 pages, and this is not a, a <coughs> novel, this is not a literary uh, work, this is a set of legal obligations. And these legal obligations are equal for the so-called core countries sure. and for non-core countries, for newcomers or how we used to be labeled. And I can tell you that I, very, I, I am very much against this labeling because in this, from this perspective, these legal obligations are equal for each one member state of the European Union. For Malta, for Cyprus, for Germany, and for Hungary as well. Uh, the problem is with this, with this uh, 
with these legal obligations. Uh, if a weaker or smaller country, in some cases, does not fulfill some of them, this can be easily punished. If a stronger European country does not fulfill these obligations, it is taken very, how should I say, very flexibly. Just two examples for sharpening the discussion. One of this is the gesture of Her Excellency Angela Merkel when she two years ago suddenly invited more than one million migrants to Germany or to the European Union. As we know, there is a Schengen system of European Union member states, and the, the Schengen system is based upon legal obligations. Among these legal obligations, we have a common visa system, and we have an obligation of protecting the borders of the whole region of the Schengen region, of the European Union region. The gesture of Her Excellency was a, a deed, a gesture against these obligations. She did not invite any member states for discussion, for conversation, for consultation. She made a unilateral gesture. This unilateral gesture was absolutely against the legal obligations of Germany as a member state of the Schengen system. A second example is the case of Greece. Greece, as I stated, five years ago has bankrupted. It was not recognized because uh, it would be would have been very unpleasant. So what happened? Bailout. Further and further injections were given to Greece, and Greek, Greece has survived until now. And what is the result or the consequence of it? That the state debt level of Greece achieved the 200% of GDP. Had this country any chance for further survival? I think not. Sooner or later, the bankruptcy will come. This whole will be made based upon the interests of some German banks or Western European banks or some circles. Instead of uh, addressing in an appropriate way the problem, they've postponed it in an illegal way because there was no legal basis for these gestures, for these steps. Uh, so that what about the equality in the European Union in legal terms? Where is the equality? And this is not a question of political will or uh, political visions. This is just a question of readiness for taking seriously the whole what have been done until now, because the European Union still does exist. But it can easily be ruined by such steps if these steps will be followed by next and further and further similar ones. About variable geometry, what uh, Professor has mentioned here, I think that is the most dangerous thing that can happen because this is the direct way to the fragmentation of Europe. A very, very direct and easy way to the fragmentation and of the, of the reshaping a Europe in which there will be so-called core countries. Core countries mean, means that developed countries. Core countries means that that is the center. And the secondary and tertiary countries, the periphery or the newcomers, how we used to be labeled after 12 years as, as well, or former socialist countries or former communist <coughs> countries. And this will lead to the, not only to the uh, legal, but to the political disintegration of the European Union. And such a disintegration, or the consequences of such a disintegration, may be terrible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome.
we have a lot of hopes concerning the Ghana generation, and you will explain to us how can we handle that. You are future. So we are listening to you. I think. Who wants to start? I think traditionally is in Austria, and I would say ladies first. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting us and giving us an opportunity to speak at this event. So, my name is Astrea, and uh, I'm supposed to introduce the current socio-political, let's say, situation in Serbia. So, as we heard already by the previous speakers, the uh, situation in Balkans is complicated, let's say it in the, the simplest mean, in the simplest way. So, uh, in order to, to understand what is happening in Serbia today is, of course, to, to observe Serbia relationally in, in the picture of the whole Balkans, but also in the picture of the foreign policies that Serbia leads today. And um, something that is quite pronounced in the, in the current moment in Serbia is what is called politics of neutrality. Or that is a direct quote of something or, or a light motive of uh, the current president, Aleksandr Vucic, just elected. Uh, so what politics of neutrality means, in his words, is uh, Serbia on European path with traditionally strong relationships with Russia. So um, coming from Aleksandr Vucic, the, the current president of Serbia, it, uh, it positions Serbia in a way to, to, to the place where Yugoslavia stand during the period of the Cold War, which is quite paradoxical because uh, Aleksandr Vočić himself uh, likes to look after Josip Broz Tito, the leader of Yugoslavia, and to compare himself to Tito as well. Uh, knowing that Aleksandar Vučić comes from radical party, radical right party, that he was 1990s, uh, second part of the 1990s, he was a minister of communication in Slobodan Milošević government as well. Um, now he's a reformed uh, progressive politician, as he, the name of his party is, Serbian Progressive Party. So it, it is interesting that he is the person who names himself uh, someone who is the leader of politics of neutrality in the Balkans. So the strategy of this politics of neutrality is basically um, allowed regarding the opposition in Serbia is quite atomized, so there is not a strong, um, well, there is not a core that would lead politics that oppose uh, Aleksandar Vučić, and also the the way that he operates and is uh, very much based into constant destabilization of the region. And by that I mean that uh, in his uh, speeches and that in his moves, he often, he often revokes the conflicts from the 1990s, but also he likes to dig deeper into history. But most pronounced conflicts that he calls are the ones with Croatia and uh, the last war in Kosovo. So he promotes himself as the factor of stability and uh, by these rhetorics that are, often happen that, that are constantly happening, he is basically operating with politics of fear and politics of fear is something that has been mentioned already today, but it is a very important uh, strategy that he uses. So this neutrality basically means standing neutral between uh, NATO and Russia regarding that Serbia is uh, after Montenegro became member of Russia yesterday officially. Uh, Serbia now stands as the last country in the region that uh, doesn't, doesn't want, let's say like that, to, to become member of NATO while all the other countries are members or are in the process of a session. So um, this, uh, this position, this neutral so-called position, uh, keeps very close relationships with Russia, but I would like to emphasize that uh, these relationships are mainly based on the cultural uh, cultural values, so um, 
what is called Orthodox Brotherhood is very, very pronounced in, in Alexander Vucic's politics. And uh, this cultural part is also something that is very much employed by Russia. So Russia is using every single opportunity to get closer to Serbia in those terms. Uh, so there are two important, or let, we can call them key events that uh, picture that well draw this this picture nicely. One is the 2014 uh, sanctions that uh, Montenegro pronounced against Russia, and also, as I already mentioned, current accession of uh, enter of Montenegro into NATO. So, starting with 2014, Russia has been uh, doing a strong pressure on Montenegro through the opposition in Montenegro, pro-Russian opposition in Montenegro. And um, in 2014, after the big floods that happened in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Russia came with uh, important help to, to the region and use the opportunity to open a so-called Serbian-Russian humanitarian center in South Serbia. So this Serbian-Russian humanitarian center operates as a NGO, let's say, and uh, is, uh, is serving as some sort of a training center for humanitarian affairs. However, there was a pressure from, and there still is a pressure from Russia to give the diplomatic immunity to all the people who work in the center, uh, which represents some sort of mystery in the region because uh, Serbia doesn't allow this immunity still. While in 2016, NATO, uh, NATO got immunity for, for their soldiers and all the employees. So NATO is also currently pushing against this move, this immunity to the humanitarian center, diplomatic immunity to the humanitarian center, because they see this institution as an emerging military base in the region. So this constant juggling between Russia and the EU accession that is an official politics of Serbia, of course, uh, is something that strongly demarcates current Serbian politics, I would say. And for, just for the end, I would shortly like to, to pose a question, and that would be how these politics constitute public opinion, which is very important to observe actually how this plays out to the everyday life and how this might play out later in potential elections that are approaching. And uh, what different polls show that there is a, a rising Euroscepticism in Serbia and also a pro-Russian sentiment that has always been present but now is rising and the latest poll uh, shows that uh, majority of Serbian citizens actually think that uh, main foreign invest investments in Serbia come from Russia, while those investments actually by the numbers, when we calculate, uh, come from the European Union at the first place and on the second place from the US. So this, uh, through these polls, we can see actually how these rhetorics um, of ju juggling between the two worlds can uh, shape public opinion with which we can see or we will see what is going to happen later. So that would be me from the, for the start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should I go? Yeah, sure. Okay, my name is Dimitar Nikolovsky. I come from Macedonia and I was uh, last week there. So I'm coming with some uh, impressions, uh, impressions that I, that I got from my last visit. And um, so the country is going through a regime change, and the new government had been um, uh, had been affirmed uh, last week uh, uh, on uh, Thursday, I think it was. Uh, so after 11 years of very problematic rule of a conservative uh, right-wing conservative party, Vamaro de Pomane, now social democrats are coming to power uh, in a coalition with some Albanian ethnic parties. And my impression from visiting uh, the country last week was that there is a lot of hope. And I will speak about this hope a little bit. Uh, I will also start off by uh, quoting a tweet from a famous uh, Macedonian artist and um, uh, oppositional activist, 
saying just simply, let me tell you what I think that foreigners are awesome. Uh, which in uh, an environment such as Macedonia was, has a very dense meaning. Uh, now I will start, already start. Uh, I will um, uh, introduce a term here that has been uh, becoming uh, quite popular in, um, in, in expert and analytical circles, especially regarding Southeast Europe, and that is stabilitocracy or stabilocracy, uh, which is uh, a kind of a relational term of governments uh, between uh, governments in the region and the EU and the US or the West, uh, generally speaking, the West. And this, uh, this relation is between what the promises are and how home politics are being conducted. And uh, this term stabi uh, stabilocracy or stabilitocracy uh, generally uh, uh, means that the West expects you uh, to uh, promise a lot of things, such as especially stability in the region, also to promote Western values, to align yourself to their uh, Western geopolitical interests, uh, to uh, uh, pronounce your commitment to European and NATO integration, while at the same time we don't care so much about what you do at home and how you behave at home. So. Uh, help us with migration, and especially uh, as uh, the major route of migration was going through Macedonia. Macedonia closed the borders, and a lot of this uh, sins of that government were forgiven for the time being. Uh, don't create too much uh, turmoil. Uh, don't make too much, uh, uh, too big conflicts with your neighbors. Small conflicts are okay. <laughs> also, uh, try to manage the ethnic relations within the country. Uh, well, with only occasional outbursts of uh, some controlled violence. And you can do anything you want at home, baby. And this, even amongst the most fervent supporters and Euro enthusiasts in Macedonia, this created a very big disappointment, disappointment with the European Union. That the European Union was not harsh enough towards the country and towards the problems that the country was facing. And what were the problems? Just just a few examples very shortly, for example, uh, the media freedom, uh, the, uh, not the state, not the government, but the ruling party took over, uh, over most of the media in the country and uh, the rating of, uh, for example, uh, reporters without borders, uh, the media freedom in the country within three or four years fell over 70 places. So, uh, so it was definitely the lowest uh, uh, when, you can, when Europe is considered. Then the obvious example uh, is the corruption, election fraud, uh, importing uh, voters from abroad, uh, faking documents uh, so that more people can vote uh, uh, more than once, or blackmailing voters into supporting the government. Furthermore, suppression of civil society and abandoning such a principle of uh, liberal democracy such as pluralism and promoting antagonism. So promoting this uh, politics of fear, something that Astrea was mentioning as well, and dividing the public in the country between the traitors and the patriots. So really increasing the conflict uh, between uh, people of various uh, ideological leanings within the country. Uh, this has uh, caused the, the uh, Freedom House to uh, uh, to give a label uh, to the country unfree for, uh, for the first time. And finally, in 2016, the European Commission uh, Pro Progress Report uh, called the country that there is a state capture in the country so that the, all the institutions have been uh, captured by a cr small criminal group. Now, last week I was in a small uh, a forum of uh, civil society in Macedonia and we had some experts and researchers from uh, from the region and also from, from Russia, from Germany, from, uh, from Hungary. Uh, and uh, there was a general conclusion that what we see is a uh, translation or a transfer of this Russian model uh, within many countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Again, about this uh, antagonism and this division of patriots uh, and uh, traitors in the country, especially uh, cracking down on civil society. Uh, and uh, in revealed documents from Macedonian counterintelligence, leaked documents from five days ago, I would say, um, 
uh, we, we can see that uh, the Russian Secret Service have been heavily involved, especially since 2008, in Macedonia, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina, all with the purpose of preventing these countries from getting closer to NATO or to joining NATO, and uh, to uh, generally to, uh, to uh, distance these countries from the West so that they can become more dependent on Russia. Uh, so while uh, the European Union is only expecting that these uh, countries um, promise stability, uh, promise to, to act in line, secret services from Russia were working towards eroding the society within. And as we can see, was, was, uh, the, uh, one of the effects was uh, that uh, a lot of people were disappointed with the European Union, even those that were pro-European. So there was paid media, that there was uh, uh, pr uh, propaganda, all going through in, in cooperation with um, uh, Serbian uh, uh, security uh, services as well. Uh, so this kind of ignorance, uh, ignorant uh, behavior of the EU was stopped first in violent events in Kumanovo in 2015, in May when there was a kind of a terrorist attack or a small mini war for, that lasted for about 24 hours with more than 20 casualties between some kind of Albanian either criminal or terrorist uh, separatists and uh, security services and especially uh, the, the, last, uh, uh, the last nail in the coffin so to say was 27th of April uh, this year when violent protesters entered the parliament and uh, beat up uh, oppositional uh, MPs and especially some Albanian uh, MPs. Um, so there were elections in 2016 in December. There was more or less equal uh, re results. Uh, however, uh, the until then ruling party did not manage to uh, create uh, the majority and to uh, have a coalition. So all the Albanian parties went with the Social Democrats. And this created a lot of ethnic tension um, uh, in the country. So Macedonia was uh, the, the a fear, uh, uh, was used for fear mongering as was the boogeyman during the uh, Serbian presidential elections and the uh, Serbian president uh, was uh, saying that he wants to prevent a Macedonian scenario, meaning a protest against the government and also some possibility of secession. Uh, and this also uh, is uh, creating uh, some kind of a new alliance uh, at the leader summit in Slovenia three or four days ago. There was an alliance between the Macedonian president and the Serbian president against the Kosovo and Albanian president. And the, uh, in the words of uh, President Vucic, that was the most severe argument they have, the, that he have, they have ever had. Uh, However, after the 27th of April violent events, there was a lot of uh, political pressure, probably a lot of uh, backdoor negotiations between uh, the West uh, and uh, the uh, leaders of this Vomero Depomane party. And finally, they decided that they are going to allow the new majority to be formed in the parliament and for the new government to be elected. We see... Uh, now I would like to stop uh, here with uh, two hopes, uh, which we don't know if they will uh, come true. But one is uh, that uh, Macedonia is a first place that we saw a stop to this regression of democracy. So stopping illiberalism, we, we can see that it's not a, a, a illiberalism or the spread of illiberalism is not an irreversible pro, uh, process. And throughout the region, there are some hopes that it might turn into a, a, a domino effect, that some of the models, especially of how civil society under those uh, conditions were working, some of these models might be translated into other society. And secondly, much more important is this uh, cross-ethnic mobilization, uh, something that we have seen in the region, but perhaps for the first time successfully. Uh, so that people who have uh, been from who are, who are coming from different ethnic camps and who had uh, fought wars uh, between themselves in the past are now standing behind a common project to stop this illiberal government and to reinstate democracy in the country. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's quite interesting report about this country, which created a lot of concern yeah. in the recent months. 
uh, for sure. Hopefully, it's going in the direction you, you described. Now, yeah. it's your uh, thank turn. you. Uh, I'm Igor, and I'm just going to talk about uh, the relation of Bos Bosnian Herzegovinian political regime and its relation to the international system. Because in one way or another, the establishment of country that we know today was strongly determined by the international environment, and especially some certain actors, as we know. So Bosnia and Herzegovina, as we know it today, was established in 1995 by the Dayton Peace Agreement that was drafted in the American military base of North Peterson, Ohio, and signed in Paris. Annex 4 of uh, this agreement represents the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and as such provides a legal framework of this country. The constitution, ironically written in English only, attributes great role to the international community, making of Bosnia and Herzegovina into some kind of semi-protectorate of great powers. In this sense, the highest authority in the country does not belong to any locally of elected official, but to the office of the high representative. Uh, virtually unaccountable to Bosnian and Herzegovinian citizens, high representative appointed by the IC steering board and endorsed by the UN Security Council, holds wide powers. Basically, he can fire any uh, uh, politician he wants uh, and is the highest legislative and executive level. Uh, so. Uh, as a result of this particularistic constitutional building, Dayton itself has become entrenched policy, compelling international community to remain deeply engaged in administering this ungovernable country that only resembles state from the outside as inside disintegrationist and anti-statist factors prevail. So looking from the perspective of international relations, we can conclude how Bosnia and Herzegovina is the case of assisted democratization. As a result of this specific transition to democracy, one that became overdetermined by the involvement of international community as the main transitional actor. Once this factor changed the nature of its involvement, basically meaning in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the shift of US foreign policy towards the East in the aftermath of 9-11, the process of the theft of the state by the main internal actors, meaning ethno-national elites, could take place. So in such a new state of things, this country has lost positive and indispensable foreign influence that was a priori contained in an ambition that led to the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement. So considering the lack of international decisiveness to finish the starter job, internal actors would feel more encouraged to build regime or more regimes that best serve their personal interest, ones uh, that stood worlds apart with practices that could potentially lead to the healing of society through democracy and social cohesion, in this way, bringing peace to Bosnia and Herzegovina only if we define peace as the absence of war. So besides uh, the internal factors, disinterested in any serious formal institutionalization and lacking pressure from the outside, we're acting inside of this established framework. And they would build a system based on the rule of informalities and arbitrariness, establishing a regime that could be defined, as we know it now, as ethno-bureaucratic patrimonialism. This ethno-bureaucratic patrimonialism represents a type of political regime established during what's considered the second transition to democracy, inside of which political behavior of people is overdetermined by essentially two factors. One, by the absolute hegemony of ethno-national objectivity of the social uh, world, implying reviving of nationalist rhetoric for political advantage, meaning that instead of a true reconciliation, Bosnia and Herzegovinian social political space is still overburdened by civil wars of memory. Uh, and all of that creates an environment inside of which war itself turns into the most important generator of meaning. Second factor is absolute patrimonialization of the bureaucratic public office, since there is a lack of state, which is the main employer in the economy, accounting, according to some estimates, to 60% of GDP, and employing one-third uh, of total workforce in the country. So while ethno-national hegemony leads to conversion of what are supposed to be citizens into politically instrumentalized subjects, thus ensuring absolute monopoly of ethno-national parties over the political life, patrimonialization of the public office leading to the patrimonialization of the state itself has the power to discipline citizens in such a way that it turns an impersonal relationship between independent voters and politicians into a disciplined relationship between patrons and clients. Consequently, in the environment that Zizek would define as a state of general permissibility, the exercise of political power derived nominally from the people becomes entirely discretionary, as rules and limits are imposed directly by the political administrator, meaning the ethno-national elites, and not by the state itself, since the state really doesn't exist. So going back to this international scenario, we can note that international community that was 
very important for the establishment of Dayton in Bosnia and Herzegovina, lacking a promising meta narrative for uh, for this country, like for example, return to Europe uh, of the Eastern Bloc with all the problems. International community has always favored security over developmental dilemma in its approach to the Bosnian problem. Thus, any involvement of international actors over, over these 20 years in Bosnia and Herzegovina would focus its attention towards the avoidance of major crises. Unfortunately, anything that would fall short of this terrible scenario would not deserve any uh, serious attention of the international community, which has thus accepted the narrative of perpetual political crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina as a normal state of affairs. So moving to the current times, we can note some troubles. So considering how the EU, uh, to whom Bosnia and Herzegovina was passed in some kind of adoption from the less interested United uh, States, uh, besides lacking stick in its foreign policy and being perplexed with internal difficulties, is unable to deliver the kind of attention that Bosnia and Herzegovina certainly needs. So we observe the involvement of some other international actors. So thus, the disarray reigning in the international system at the moment created a vacuum which has been somewhat exploited by other powers that historically had some influence in the area. So in this sense, Russia, which in terms of economic exchange has much less significant relation with the Balkans, it's 13 times less significant actually, than the EU, can hardly leverage some more serious influence in normal conditions. This is to say Balkans, at least ex-Yugoslavian space, is in one way or another destined to look towards Europe. However, Russian geopolitical symbolic influence, meaning sometimes orthodoxy as well, just like its importance in the UN Security Council and Peace Implementation Council, give her a degree of power to meddle into the Bosnian Herzegovinian problem, essentially by using the secessionist rhetoric of Republic of Srpska to play with it the chess game of Trojan horse of the Balkans. This, thus, it is understandable that Russia will use opportunity of weaker EU uh, or troubling EU and rising or never-ended nationalist rhetoric while these options remain on the table. On the other hand, the importance of Turkey, while also much less significant compared to the EU's, remains nevertheless, especially through cultural exchange and education, but also economic impact way more real than the Russian. The relations between the most important ethno-national Bosniak party and the current regime in Turkey seem very rooted, as Bosniak member of presidency even participated through the video link in the Turkish presidential campaign. So in this environment of international stability, which is consequently reflected in Bosnia and Herzegovinian instability, the last year's referendum of Republic of Srpska, or recent intensification of story of the third Croat entity, had met relatively little serious response from the EU authorities, while US, for example, is imposed sanctions on Dodik. Additionally, the rise of nationalist rhetoric and rather controversial involvement of regional governments of Serbia and Croatia, which are guarantees of Dayton, with respective constitutive, constitutive political forces in Bosnia and Herzegovina, remains an impediment for internal cohesion, serious healing, and effective integration. Thus, while there exists a shortage of credible threat of Western partners towards the nationalist and separationist rhetoric, the problem is unlikely to disappear especially considering the historically weak civil societies of the region that even in their most civic version still seem incapable to offer real political counterweight to the established interest. Maybe we notice something different in Macedonia. So finally, even, this, even if this intervention was dominated by certain dose of pessimism, I would like to note how other and more encouraging stories do nevertheless exist in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In this sense, social protests of 2013 and 2014, flood crisis of 2014, and recent struggles of high school students of the city of Jajce to stop further ethno-social divisions embodied in the projects of two schools <coughs> under one roof, just like the rise of political agrupations which in one way or another question the national objectivity of the social as the only relevant one, uh, thus slipping out of the matrix propagated by the dominant establishment offer possibilities of some interesting developments. However, for now, Bosnia and Herzegovina, deeply conditioned by the ethno-national narratives of lived reality, insignificant process of social reconciliation, and unfortunate importance of irresponsible politics, is unlikely to perform well in advance of troubling times. This being said, obvious incapacity of local politicians to take further than their personal short-term interest, once paired with the inexistence of any real process of historical learning, may turn into a potent mix if Balkans, for some unfortunate reason, become interesting place of foreign conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I, I would appreciate uh, Dr. Busek's uh, comment about the EU as a peace project, but I really do fear for its future as a peace project. Uh, as you probably know, the Commission President uh, Juncker has, in his State of the Union address in, uh, I think it was September in Strasbourg, he said uh, he, the EU needed to, quote, toughen up. And he wants full complementarity with NATO. Uh, and if you stop and look at the whole project of NATO, NATO is really still occupying under the auspices of the United States, much of Europe. I mean, you have uh, the so-called nuclear sharing program, about which I've been very, very concerned personally, just because 60 of the US nuclear weapons are now in Turkey. Um, and uh, there's rumors of them being moved. This seems to me is very worrying, and I don't see that um, uh, NATO is going to easily give up its hundred some bases in Germany, nor its bases in Italy or several other European countries because they allow US power to be exercised within the EU. Fundamentally, it seems to me, affecting democracy within the EU. And as far as the Balkans are concerned, it's a rather minimal issue for them. It doesn't really bother them. They can just go back to doing what they did in Serbia some years ago because bombing is their favorite way of doing things. Um, the other uh, thing to take a look at, I think, one happy note, is uh, Macron's election is one thing, but Macron himself, I hadn't realized until I read a piece in that obscure newspaper known as the Irish Times, that Macron was the um, assistant to Paul Ricoeur, the French philosopher. And if you stop and listen to Macron's speeches, you begin to hear recour. And I think this could be a very, very positive development with regard to European values. Okay, other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed all the contributions and uh, they gave too much food for thought. I want to just to concentrate on one. Uh, it mentioned that the outcomes of the Dutch and French elections are somehow making hope that at least the core of the European Union is still functional. I am a bit afraid that this is a very uh, positivist view, because in both countries, the right-wing parties reached their highest performance. Right. Now, the question is, of course, a very fundamental one, and I believe uh, maybe the uh, panelist could elaborate on it, whether the uh, emergence of populist or right-wing parties in many of the European countries are a sign of a shift and a will a change towards these policies, or is it a kind of wake-up call for the established parties that people want a different politics? I mean, as uh, Professor Baba uh, mentioned, that Merkel, I mean, uh, you, you can do politics, uh, but uh, there are laws, uh, you cannot shift it and, and then sell it as, as it is now. Suddenly for a year we are, we are good people, now uh, she is becoming as people in Germany, uh, she was a Chancellor of the welcome, now she's a Chancellor of the uh, expelling people. Um, so uh, this is where I see I, I sense that in many countries people want change and they do not see, uh, let's say, the alternatives or, or, or longing for an alternative within the mainstream democratic parties and a, a success in, in, Nor in, in Netherlands and we shall see what will be the French uh, Parliament's composition in a couple of weeks, uh, whether it is uh, giving Macron a strong enough basis to, uh, to uh, fulfill the hopes many people uh, built on him. Thank you. I had a couple comments though from the first speakers. Um, you know, the most of most of the acts of terrorism um, are being uh, designed to target civilians, not in this 
part of the world at all. So, you know, we have to consider ourselves extremely fortunate that we have had so few terrorist um, targeted incidents and that we have actually a structure um, like response um, to the, the most recent um, attacks in London, for example, that does not exist in other parts of the world. The uncertainty, and this kind of will lead into the discussions for tomorrow with LMA Honkish, the uncertainty that we experience today in what could be called core countries, I consider Hungary kind of part of this sphere of influence, is what most people in the world have been experiencing for centuries, okay? It's only now starting to infiltrate our part of the world. And I think that that's something that we need to take a look at and, and also take responsibility for why most of the world has been living in insecurity and violence for the last um, several hundred years. Um, it's mostly due to the actions of this part of the world. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention um, that I see also in common between Trump, Putin, and Erdogan is that they all have common economic interests. They're all intertwined, not just politically, but economically. And I find that this collusion between politics and economics has the most detrimental um, impact on democ democracy in countries. Um, the other thing, let's see, um, was um, the, the, the construction of Europe um, without core and peripheries. Then um, are you talking about Europe and its so-called values? Because when Ivan was talking, there was this um, uh, contrast between European values, which I actually think Angela Merkel embodied when she welcomed a million um, immigrants and refugees to Germany, as to obligation, which has the higher moral authority, European values or legal obligations. And in that sense, from the reports that I read, both Europe and the United States have to import 50 million immigrants in the next 50 to 100 years in order to maintain the standard of living that now we now enjoy because of the decreasing population, the demographics of that population. There's not going to be anyone or enough people in this region to support the structures, economic structures, taxation structures that we have. So, I mean, you can say that um, she was not meeting the legal obligation, but there is definitely a moral obligation um, to, to better assist um, a humanitarian crisis right in our own bathtub here. Thank you very much, I share your opinion on this subject. But I may say, if you are looking to, to uh, what is needed uh, by a shrinking population, then the Russians must be very interested to get more, because this is a real shrinking population, overaged and so on and so on. I think uh, that's a different approach. I'm not quite sure that those of Africa or wherever are eager to come to Russia. So I think that if we give up our moral obligations concerning the functioning of the European Union, it will lead to the collapse of the European Union. Moral obligation is a well, it is a, it's an opinion. Your opinion is that, that uh, Merkel's moral obligation was this what he did. There are other opinions as well concerning this gesture, so that I don't think that it is an ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, position. So that I think that uh, if the European Union will not stick, and the politicians of the European Union will not stick to the legal standards and to the legal framework of the European Union, it will need to the collapse of the whole system. This is the only framework which can keep together this uh, uh, union, which is facing many, many problems and many, many challenges. And if we give up this legal framework, then we give up practically the basis of it. Mr. Chair, if I may, I think there's a very deep, very deep problem but both Jody and Ivan formulated, they both contain elements of truth. There are moral obligations, um, but they need to be put in a structure or need to be interpreted um, in, order to be, um, or in order to become kind of values that
can be taken um, by a global or a continental community. This hasn't happened. It came, the situation came uh, out of the blue uh, for those who were not prepared. And this is a paradox here. We all knew, we, I mean those people who are dealing with social sciences, history, culture, that this is going to happen. There were all in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, predictions that if the Western world, including the EU or the EC, is not going to change its attitude and behavior, and is not going to prepare um, with new, with, by creating new structures <coughs> in terms of aid, etc., etc., the global south will come. It, it was predicted. It is, and at the same time, we were not able here in, in the core of the world, not able um, because of our egotism, because of several, several reasons, we were unable to prepare for this, forecasted fact. On the other hand, I think Ivan is right that if you have a community which is based upon upon the Roman law and, and as a consequence of it, you, you, can, you destroy it if you don't take it seriously. Big buy because of you are the strongest one. I mean, that, the problem is bilateralism. Bilateralism started about 15 years ago in, big, in a big way in the European community. Why? Because integration did not work well enough. And why didn't it work well enough? Because 8991 became as a very sudden threat. Uh, and it was camouflaged, camouflaged by, by the big, big uh, uh, cheers, as if Western powers would be very cheerful that the Eastern European as, <laughs> are the barbarians are coming. They were not. They, again, they were not prepared. Eastern enlargement became a, a <clears throat> kind of a created a chaotic situation. Um, and I would, I would kindly propose here something for all of you to consider. Um, why don't we think differently about political, social, and economic change? We all wanted to believe that it happened like um, overnight. 89, okay, 89, 91. Um, as I say, it, we were not prepared for that. Why don't we consider that was a long change, a long durée? transformation, and we are just approaching the end of it. Instead of uh, building, as uh, the, George Bush suggested, <coughs> uh, a new world order, we created a world disorder in, in 30 years. Now, now we need, have to start to consider what to do with the Cold War institutions, such as NATO. We all knew, those who were in this debate, we I mean, know many, many people, Mary Calder, many, they were already in the 80s suggesting that NATO should transform itself, maybe even approaching Russia. There, were, there was a talk within Russia, Yeltsin uh, brought this up, that maybe, yeah, yeah, but, but we, nothing has happened. So we are trying to deal, trying to solve old problems with the old means uh, against the suggestion of um, Albert Einstein. It's not possible. Okay, so we are creating more and more chaos by not being able to understand, to interpret the world how it has changed. And now, Jody is, I think, absolutely right. We in the, the Golden West, is <coughs> just uh, paraphrasing uh, Roger Scruton, who last week gave an interview. Roger Scruton is a quite well known, very, very, very conservative British philosopher. And he he hailed Hungary and praised Hungary, suggesting that Hungary, in this terrible world, is an island of peace. Well, well thank you. I'm very we were talking in the peace movement, the European peace movement, about the peace of cemeteries. I mean, uh, you know, there are different kinds of peace. There is active peace, and there is kind of the peace of a zoo. Yeah? But everything is controlled by fences, and so we have to be very careful with these notions. Everyone is building fences now. <coughs> Happily, I heard Lithuania started to build fences. There are some countries, some politicians are very proud of building fences. Some others are doing it um, sub rosa. But this is not going to solve it. It might postpone. 
problems or facing problems in, in a directly, but it's not going to solve any problems. So what, what happens now? I think <clears throat> we have to start from the scratch and, and rethink the consequences of 89 and 91, which has not been happening up until now. That's my just to add something, I agree with you completely on this, but you know, the, the problem with what's happening, especially in the United States, is um, evidenced in a piece that the National Security Advisor and one of his aides wrote the other day, in which they said, there is no such thing as a global community. And that's what we're up against. Uh, Mr. Session told us yeah. in 89 that there's no such thing uh, such a society. There's only, there's only market and individuals. I think I want to contradict, especially at the last moment, no global community. I think we have a lot of global communities, for example, on culture, uh, on communications, and, and, and. I think it's nearly endless. Our problem is we are not able to handle the existing global communities. You have to be conscious of it. Because we have, uh, I think, no regulations. Here, I think the need for common law in this sense is quite necessary. I think if you're looking to the hackers, for example, this is global community in a negative way. It's existing, it's working, they are successful. And where are the possibilities or where are the ways politically, I think, to handle it, and to, 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 to create a kind of framework and so on and so on. Uh, I think also concerning uh, NATO outdated, for sure, NATO is outdated, but there are no efforts concerning the danger of security on other fields. I think uh, I'm in favor of a NATO concerning hackers, uh, something like that. Where is it? Huh? I think the real question justified is in our developed part of the world and in comparison with other parts, we are living still comparatively comfortable comfortable uh, to other parts. Uh, but we are obviously politically not able to develop instruments. I think this is a request for the politicians and sometimes it's also a request to the scientists. Thank you very much for this conversation. It was really very rich of ideas. And maybe I would like to pick up an idea which uh, can sound quite strange because very uh, um, probably is right that uh, we are in an absolutely new age with uh, new horizons, and perhaps uh, new concepts should be developed or old concepts should be reformulated. And I would propose that uh, we should forget about peace as, a, as an ideal state, because uh, we have to cope with the fact, sad fact perhaps, that we are not going to live in peace. Uh, Tolstoy was right uh, when he uh, wrote a novel about war and peace, and perhaps we shall have to we shall have to face a future where war and peace uh, will coexist with each other and not uh, uh, even geographically, so there will be the peace and here is the war. But uh, my, my major uh, source of concern that war is on the same place where peace is. Therefore, inner wars which we have to face with, and I do not think that uh, this is something which we, we, we do understand, the real nature of these inner wars. And uh, enemies and friends, these are two very important uh, uh, definitions, but all of them, or both of them, uh, are very much needed in order to find identity. And I think that the major problem which we, which we have now, that we lost our identity, we forgot our identity. And uh, if we don't have an identity, we are not able to differentiate who is the friend and who is the, uh, who is the enemy. And if we are not able to uh, find these definitions, then we shall condemn ourselves to death. That's my problem. Professor Bogard, you mentioned this question of uh, right-wing parties. I think that this is a, is a consequence of a deep disappointment of people. Those who are now voting for these parties, most probably are not all of them bigger, bigger, belonging to the uh, right-wing ideology. They are disappointed with the, with the others. All right. This is the meaning of this. This is much more a signal for the others. A signal for asking more responsibility from the side of, of, of uh, centrist and liberal and, and, and moderate parties. I have three points and some specific uh, questions. Um, but let me go back to one thing that 
basically, I think this, uh, with regard to the European Union, whether it's a uh, legal community or a moral community or a political community, uh, is a question that has been coming up <coughs> ever since the uh, first uh, enlargement way back in, in the uh, uh, 70s. Um, and it reminds me of uh, uh, Polonius uh, in Hamlet, uh, looking at the cloud. He says, this looks like an elephant, uh, says Hamlet. And Polonius says, yes, my lord, he thinks it's like an elephant. And then he changes his mind, says, well, uh, he thinks it uh, looks like a camel. He is, it might look like a camel. So, uh, uh, the point is that I think what uh, uh, George Jensen said is, is very important, that there is a, uh, at least a, our generation, uh, which is the same, um, is uh, uh, committed to a, a moral outlook in the world because we have seen uh, this peace project work uh, in um, uh, the end of the Second World War to the present. Now, it is being threatened. Uh, and we feel that that threat uh, can be uh, mortal for uh, the future of the European Union. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think one of the ways out of this dilemma is to stop thinking that the European Union is so fragile. Um, it, it is not a fragile. It, it is rather if we take it realistically as an intergovernmental organization with committed governments, then this whole question of um, the problems of democratic deficit and uh, Europe not moving, it's like a bicycle, if it stops it will fall, and all these negative uh, uh, ideas of the fragility of the Union, we have to chase them away to um, look at the uh, successful and potentially successful sides of the, of the European Union. And I am not taking an issue with you. Uh, it is that we're coming from different, uh, uh, different perspectives that I have uh, much more of an optimistic hope, uh, having seen the accomplishments of the European Union. And I do not think that, in fact, it, uh, there will be a detrimental amount of uh, uh, centri uh, centrifugal pressure on the European Union. And that brings me to uh, what I said about these two elections. Um, it, it's true that there was a switch to the right, but the point is that the ultra-nationalist parties were just proven not to have a, a, a massive popular support in those countries. And that is, uh, that is an important point. I mean, swinging to the right, af after all, I mean, uh, the, the essential Western democracy is just uh, slight swings between center right and center left. And uh, we are seeing, as you said, a, um, a, uh, a swing to the, uh, to the right in many countries. But I think uh, the causes are different. I mean, I could not have expected anybody in France to vote for a socialist after the disastrous performance of the uh, uh, last president. And that's, that has nothing to do with, with ideology. Uh, it, was, it was a farce. Um, with regard to uh, the, um, the issue of populism, I've been doing some thinking, and we have to do some more thinking about the issue of populism. We tend to denigrate populism and say basically, um, you know, this is bad, and this populism leads to uh, corruption, economic uh, malfeasance, and, and so on and so forth. And yes, it does. But uh, how can populism be reversed in a... Uh, uh, in countries where uh, there are uh, elections and elections are encouraged and ultimately popular vote decides the outcome. So why is populism here right now so uh, important in 
very many different countries that have very different uh, traditions of uh, uh, governance, governments, uh, uh, and strong or weak democracies, and, and so on. One is that I think we're all facing, in varying degrees, the same problem that there is an anti-elite movement in the world. And I'm wondering occasionally, I haven't done my full thinking of it, but whether this is our own making that confusing the notion of elite with the notion of undemocratic clans. Um, and that also relates to the, I think, issue that I use the word core, for example. I did not assign uh, a value to the word core when I was talking about the core. I was, it was a historical fact that six countries began this, and that's what I meant by core. And I did not use the word periphery. Uh, so every time one uses the word core, one does not have to use the word periphery. Core is something, maybe the foundation, and then something can grow from that core. Uh, there will be a relation between the core and the periphery. And my generation also grew up with um, uh, macrosociology, uh, uh, center and periphery theory of Edward Schultz. And this was later taken by uh, the next generation in, uh, in terms of economy, and center meant uh, Western economies and periphery meant uh, all these countries uh, which we colonized and extracted uh, their goods and so on. But that was not the idea of center periphery. I mean, the, the idea of center periphery that, that uh, uh, Schultz had in mind, essentially, was that there are center institutions and the those are, who are not participating in the center institutions actually aspire to participate. And center institutions include major universities that are not closed in an ideal democratic system to others, but they are competitive, of course, you cannot. But the, the point is that uh, the center was something that people aspired to, and all of a sudden, we have a situation where there is a reaction against the center, uh, there is a reaction against the elite, and that is basically uh, a, a, an ideological reaction. It, I believe, uh, may also be related, given the red states in the United States, uh, given what's happening in, in, in uh, Turkey, uh, for example, uh, more or less 50% support to have a uh, strong president uh, with a uh, record uh, such as we have uh, seen. Uh, that is uh, basically a, uh, a, another confusion that is paralleling this popular populist uh, thing, that the notion of national will, so actually a majoritarian vote has a legitimacy in itself that overwhelms and overrides the legitimacy of minority or plurality. And those I am quite worried about. As a, as a matter of fact. The, it is not so much what we look at as democratic deficit in Brussels and so on, but people are voting for these national governments, and national governments get into intergovernmental uh, agreements. That I do not see as a problem. As much of a problem as the fact that uh, uh, national will of a very simple majority basically uh, gives legitimacy to majoritarian governments. Uh, I was about to, to make the remarks, look, look into my neighbors here, I regret a little bit that we are not discussing your reports. Uh, I think it's extremely valuable, uh, but uh, some things I would uh, raise some questions. I think, for example, you spoke about Serbia, 
and the ten tendency uh, of uh, Vucic now, I think, to follow the example of the position of former Yugoslavia, uh, trying to be neutral. And, but there's one problem. I think uh, former Yugoslavia had a cooperation with India and so on and so on. With whom? It is not interesting what Serbia is doing concerning a neutrality. Or going in between, going in between, between whom? I think you might be instrumentalized uh, by Putin, uh, but the interest of Putin on Serbia is also not so big. Uh, I think it's not a place where the next decisions are uh, in all other countries are not happening here. So far, I think maybe, and that's a question which, which I want to raise to our beloved director, I think it might be necessary the next step to speak about information today. I think that's one of the key questions. We are discussing fake news uh, and so on and so on. I think it would be very interesting in this context to discuss all the efforts uh, on information. I think Russia today is not a success story. Uh, the Russians are investing a lot of money on this, but real influence by this? Really not. Huh? I think so far it might be interesting not only to look to Russia today, or the Chinese are today present, and I think if you are looking to the uh, US TV stations, I think uh, uh, Fox News is horrible, and uh, CNN was better before. Uh, I think here is something happening concerning how valid are informations really and what is done. And this is connected with the question of populism, uh, also for sure, because it should be primitive, because something is too complicated, uh, even. I can actually relate to, to this idea of the uh, importance of communication today. And um, after the last attack in London, Theresa May had a speech and she said a really, really interesting stuff that's been resonating in my head for the last 48 hours. She basically said that uh, all this that happened, we should blame internet. And what we now need is a stronger policing of internet because internet is a place of complete freedom that we cannot regulate. So we need regulation of this space in order to prevent terrorism. And this causal connection of, of the two things, it's, I think, I think something that re can return us to, to one of the first words today that we heard is third world war. And I think that this thinking about information where well, battles are happening constantly, and internet as a space, of, as this battlefield of, of information today is something that, that represents this clinch of the, the analog and the digital world and uh, the importance of the digital world and uh, the freedom or place of manipulation that it allows is I think something that is really important but I, I would say maybe even not enough addressed today through through all of our speeches because it is definitely a place where where a lot of battles are happening today That's and uh, that is also space of civil society in a way that <coughs> both Dimitar and I mentioned that civil society is absent from from the Balkans but uh, it does exist on internet, but the, the question of regulation of internet is, I think, something that is coming, especially with with her speech a few days ago. I think it's it's something that we should expect, and that's something that we should address more in in our questioning of the current affairs. I think here I have to add, it's also raising the question: also, what means freedom of speech today? Freedom of speech is one of the basics of democracy, without any doubt. Uh, but what does it mean today? Because if everybody is asking for limits, uh, where are you starting and where are you ending concerning the limits? Who will decide? Yeah? Who will decide? And who will decide, yeah? I think in all, all my respect for, for Mrs. May, uh, I'm not eager that Mrs. May is deciding, but it's, uh, <laughs> We have freedom of speech uh, uh, and so on and so on. Nothing against her, but the key question for the future. Yeah? I would like to again add to the last point of a strand to connect it to this popularity of right wing populism. 
something that Jim o always says is that we are flooded with information today and voters are flooded with information the, we are too much informed but not knowledgeable and so far uh, mainstream political parties or centrist or whatever you want to call them have not been able to capitalize on this however if populism is this notion of dividing society between the people and their discursive other nothing does it better today and nothing reduces reality so much uh, as much as uh, a meme on, online and it has been a very powerful mobilizing tool for uh, for the radical right for especially for uh, mobilizing voters uh, that's one point uh, that I wanted to make the second one is about NATO I I'm not a big NATO supporter and I find myself uh, quite in a weird position to be to be defending uh, NATO at, at some point. However, it's not so much about the rationality of being a member of NATO. Yeah, it's quite irrational in the Balkans that uh, uh, people believe that NATO is a guarantee for peace and stability. Uh, so, especially in terms of uh, relations between uh, Albanians, uh, Albanians in Macedonia and Macedonians, uh, Albania, Kosovo uh, relations with uh, Montenegro, Macedonia uh, and Serbia, this membership uh, will create a feeling of safety much more. So. Okay, on your side? Okay, after all this I don't really have much to add. I was just uh, read an interesting comment uh, couple of days ago and it relates a lot to what we said today and I don't really like to add any this kind of uh, connotations to the terms especially regional terms but uh, it's, it's said that instead of uh, Europeanization of uh, Balkans we tend to see Balkanization of uh, Europe. <laughs> I think, beg your pardon, it is a nice phrase uh, but it's not covering all the reality. Yeah. I think Balkan, Balkan means uh, division, falling into parts, and so. But we're also very much connected. I think all of the, the Balkanic uh, states are very much connected and depending on each other. It, it, it was, we should continue this debate during the summer university. But both can be true. Both can be true. That we, are we are living in different realities. We are totally right. We are getting more and more fragmented. Five years ago, we believed that we belong together in the European Union and integration. Now everyone is, is pushing and pursuing his or her own interests. So we, the, the pendulum or the, the spiral goes down towards more and more fragmentation. And this is the arrow of the time. So the question is, if we have any alternative, how to how to stop it? Hmm? Let's think about it and, and um, well, we continue next time. Thank you very much. That is very, very interesting. So cool. <laughs>